Hi everybody, I'm Orla Drummond and I'm here to talk to you today about the access to justice barriers for tribunal users and it's based on a comparative case study on SEN tribunals in Northern Ireland and Wales. Okay, so the presentation is based on the empirical findings of the research of my PhD and it touched on the theoretical understanding of participation and highlighted the underlying differences in the Northern Irish and Welsh experience of devolution and the subsequent development of social policy. So today I'd like to um, look at the background to the research, the participating groups, look at some of the key findings, the general barriers to participation at SEN tribunals, issues surrounding child participation in the process, and then general recommendations for improving accessibility and participation. Okay, so the research comparatively examined SEN tribunals in Northern Ireland and Wales, examining in particular how participatory they were in light of Article 12.2 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which states that children should be provided the opportunity to be heard in any judicial or administrative administrative proceeding affecting them. And also in light of Article 7.3 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which ensures that children with disabilities have the right to express their views freely on all matters affecting them, and they're to be provided with disability and age-appropriate assistance to realise that right. The decision to examine both jurisdictions comparatively stems from their differing approaches to child participation. So the Welsh had piloted the child right to appeal through the Education Wales measure of 2009 in Carmarthenshire and Wrexham. And at the time, Northern Ireland retained a traditional and still retains it until the bill comes into effect, a traditional approach with parental right to appeal only. So the focus of the research was to examine how participatory SEN tribunals were in light of international obligations, while also examining if the political, parental and judicial will existed to implement innovative and expanded participatory approaches. It also aimed to identify the need for support mechanisms or possible legislative advances, and it also aimed to investigate if any new mechanisms of support required were feasible in a climate of economic decline. Theoretically, it engaged with concepts of meaningful participation and administrative justice, drawing upon the philosophical debate regarding the relationship between the citizen and the state, but I won't go into that today. The theoretical framework was based on the premise that children's parity of participation is the normative ideal professed by the UN in, the Article, tw in Article 12 of the UNCRC and strengthened for children with disabilities by Article 7 of the UNCRPD. And the research advanced the argument for the creation of formal opportunities for children to give effective voice to their opinions within legal forums. So before we look at the key findings, it's important to keep in mind the distinct political environments um, in both Northern Ireland and Wales, as this may go some way to explain why there's been a development of a child rights agenda in Wales and a lack of one in Northern Ireland. So we have two very different experiences of devolution. Of course, we all know the background here, um, coming out of conflict based on a peace agreement, a fragmented political environment, and entrenched constitutional debates which have taken precedence over social policy. There seems to have been a reluctance to implement any child rights initiatives. So these periods of intense political wrangling and periods of stagnation have plagued our devolution project. Um, and research by Horgan and Gray highlighted that when the Assembly is in action, ministers tend to act on an individual basis, fervently protective of their own budgets and developing policy in isolation, something they've termed as a silo mentality. Um, Wales was very different. They were initially restricted by limitations on legislative autonomy, meaning that they were a social policy parliament which at that time possessed powers in the field of children's policy, and so they took it and ran with it. And their government rhetoric really advances this notion of citizenship instead of that neoliberal consumerism that sometimes we see in traditional approaches to politics. So they were more concerned with voice rather than choice. And they also incorporated the UNCRC into domestic legislation through the Rights um, of Children and Young Persons Wales Measure of 2011, which places a duty on all Welsh ministers to have due regard to the substantive rights and obligations within the UNCRC and its optional protocols. 
So for my research, um, there were 10 families from Northern Ireland and nine from Wales with direct experience of the tribunal, and they discussed their experiences and perceptions of the tribunal, was providing space to think about tribunal accessibility, additional support mechanisms, and the possibility of enhanced child participation. As respondent department bodies whose decisions are challenged, I also spoke to two local authorities in Wales and two education and library boards here in Northern Ireland. Um, I spoke to three tribunal panel members in Wales and three Northern Irish panel members um, of both sets of tribunals. Um, in terms of tribunal administrative staff and government departments, that's where there's a bit of a difference in the research. Um, I spoke to two members of CENTU, who's Special Educational Needs Tribunal Wales. I spoke to their secretariat and a member of the Department of Education and Skills in Wales. Um, unfortunately here, um, the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service wouldn't permit one-to-one -one interviews, and this was also the case with the Department of Justice. Um, instead, they held a joint meeting in Stormont. I was invited along um, to speak to two um, Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service staff and one representative from the Civil Justice Policy and Legislative Division of the DOJ, and responses to the interview questions were gained through a written submission. Um, I also contacted the Department of Education, who also declined to be interviewed, and provided another written statement. So essentially from the outset, the emphasis was on child participation, but during the interview process there was an outpouring of general barriers to participation from those currently using special educational needs tribunals in both Northern Ireland and Wales. There was a general concern that those from poor backgrounds and or those with lower literacy rates and confidence levels were excluded from the process. And these are two quotes from panel members in both Northern Ireland and Wales. And from the panel member in Northern Ireland, they said, too often tribunals are the mechanism of the middle class and too many people from poor backgrounds don't understand the system or they're intimidated by the system and they don't take part. And I find that incredibly sad because there's a much greater need. And there was a similar sentiment um, given by panel members in Wales. And one said, the number of appeals have dropped significantly in Wales recently and there's no clear explanation for why that should be. And I'm concerned that it may be a combination of those parents who really need to be able to access the system, not having the confidence to do so. If they're unable to access the system, then there's something wrong with the system. Families also expressed concerns for those who may require additional support, being unable to access any type of support mechanisms, and there was a sense of worry about the lack of knowledge of legal services available. Other barriers that arose during the research. First one there, there was a real scepticism um, regarding alternative dispute resolution services um, in both jurisdictions. One family from Northern Ireland said, I didn't go down the Dars route because there was no point. And a parent from Wales said, it was awful, it was badly run. The support that we were expecting wasn't there, it's toothless. And there was a real sense that it wasn't legally binding and that parents felt that their rights would not be safeguarded through this mechanism. So there was real scepticism regarding um, Dars here. Um, parents also relayed substantial difficulties when seeking advice and support. Uh, one possible explanation for the limitation of services was the budgetary constraints of support organisations. We know from Gen's research that legal participation requires knowledge and advice about obligations, rights, remedies and procedures for resolving justiciable issues. Unfortunately, the findings from this research indicate parents in both Northern Ireland and Wales are struggling to identify and engage with such support mechanisms. And while tribunals are heralded as informal, welcoming, inquisitorial environments, findings from this study indicate that SEN tribunals are formal, legalistic, adversarial and intimidating for users. Parents stated that they had trouble with the complexity of the law, that it was like being in court. And it's fair to say that there was a notable difference in relation to those who had legal representation and those who hadn't. And you see two quotes there, one from a Northern Irish family and one from a Welsh family. Um, when asked about their experience of the tribunal, the first one said, ah, horrendous, absolutely horrendous. And the family in Wales said, I think it was absolutely horrendous. It was the worst thing to have to go through. And they weren't the only two respondents. That seemed to be the typical response from most people who had been through the tribunal. One major outstanding barrier was the inequality of legal arms between parents and education boards. 
and local authorities, leading us to question the fairness of the proceedings. Parents felt that the system was stacked against them and essentially the tribunals weren't a level playing field. They also expressed the detrimental impact on mental and physical health, their marital relationships and finances. Families struggled with day-to-day -day life, the pressures of work, the pressures of parenting and caring responsibilities of a child with special educational need and therefore preparation and participation at tribunal was just another element of stress for them. There was a dissatisfaction with the process even when they received a favourable outcome and this was particularly in the recording of that outcome. So even when education boards or local authorities conceded to the wants of parents, it was simply recorded as the case being withdrawn. Uh, parents, particularly in Wales, felt that this was unfair and it did not reflect the outcome of the proceedings. In terms of children's participation in the process, the power relation between adults and children was identified as a key conceptual barrier. Parents felt that they should provide the voice of the child within the process and that this would be in the best interest of the child. Some parents raised concerns that the child's voice could actually work against their best interest and that their involvement could hinder the decision-making process. As you can see, there's two quotes there, one from a parent from here and one from a parent from Wales. We made our child aware of nothing and I think where that's concerned it all depends on the child and I think you decide what's best for your child. And the parent from Wales said, they wanted to speak to my child regarding their feelings and what they felt. I made hell over it. I had to write to the tribunal saying that I didn't agree to it because he doesn't understand. There was also a lot of worry surrounding what would happen if the child could appeal but was in disagreement with their parent. And this was highlighted by one Welsh panel member um, who stated that in cases of conflict, underlying primary legislation, which is the Education Act, would always give preference to the parent's voice if invoked. So they had stated that until you've tackled the fundamental issues of the potential conflict between the parent's views and the child's views and how those might be dealt with by the tribunal, then it's going to prove quite difficult to fully incorporate the child's right to appeal. There were a number of attitudinal issues identified from the responses of participants pertaining to conceptual constructs of childhood and children's rights were often qualified by understandings of childhood underscored by cognitive and emotional incompetence. Responses from all respondents were influenced by notions of the, the child's age and capacity. Another outstanding concern was the need to shield children from the process and or sensitive personal information in order to safeguard them from knowledge of the dispute and or their additional support needs or their disability in some cases. So if you take two, the look at the two quotes there, um, the first one from a Northern Irish family said, even if I'd taken it to court to the High Court, I would never have had my child in court or speaking about it because in my child's head and in my child's world, he's the smartest child and there's nothing. He's perfect, part of it is protection for your child. And the person from Wales said, I don't think it would be a good idea to actually take them to the hearing unless it was totally changed. Should a child be exposed to someone from the education department going, well, this child isn't able or this child can't do that, it did get quite nasty. Parents, members of the judiciary, the Welsh Secretariat, education boards and local authorities all felt that the SEN tribunal process was too lengthy, formal and legalistic to involve children. Many felt it was too court-like an environment, too clinical and adult-like. Respondents were concerned that it would be too daunting and too traumatic for a child to attend. One of the key issues was that children might be cross-examined by legal representatives. As one Northern Irish panel member said, what I want is what's best for the child and being best for the child is not being aggressively questioned by an over-ambitious young barrister. Um, a Welsh parent said, the last one we had was very short and would have been awful for our child because the barrister was so confrontational. Barristers are paid to be quite nasty, aggressive, and I was going to say destructive because that's how they work, isn't it? They take you apart in order to prove their point. So this was a concern across the board, particularly in light of the inequality of legal arms that currently exists within the process. In terms of differences between Wales and Northern Ireland, judicial attitudes to granting the children the full right to appeal was one key area where there was differences. 
In Northern Ireland, the judiciary were quite conservative. In fact, one of them said it was a nonsense to um, incorporate the child right to appeal, where in Wales they talked about child citizenship <laughs> and expanding child participation. So that was a real difference. Again, the political will to implement changes to advance child participation um, seems to be where there was a massive difference because the Welsh have taken the lead in the initiative um, and went ahead and piloted the appeal. I know now we have the bill coming in, so that's a step in that direction, I suppose. But generally, the findings found that both families in Northern Ireland and Wales experienced similar difficulties when engaging with SEN tribunals and relayed the same attitudinal position in terms of child participation in the process. So there were some general recommendations to make the process fair, more equitable and accessible and participatory. Um, respondents felt that adapting process to meet the needs of all users would be one way, expanding support through pre-hearing advice and support, um, improving tribunal-based information, expanding time limits, improved awareness of the tribunal, expanding the inquisitorial enabling function of the tribunal to challenge that formal legalistic and adver adversarial environment as it currently exists, um, addressing the inequality of legal arms, improving the monitoring of decisions and changing the recording and statistics on outcomes. Crucially, the findings from this research highlight that in order to hear children's voices within the process, particularly a child considered to have a disability, there is a requirement to be adaptive to their needs. Is legislation enough? I would say no. The evaluation of the pilot in Wales showed that there had been no appeals and only one case of disability discrimination taken by a child. I would suggest that some of the issues raised by this research would go some way to explain why that has been the case. There is a need to acknowledge children as rights holders, addressing the attitudinal concerns of adults. We need to develop innovative methods and mediums of collecting the voice of the child responsive to that child's needs and develop advocate and support services. We need to address concerns regarding the tribunal setting and build the capacity and communication skills of the judiciary, tribunal staff and legal representatives. When asked if parents felt that children should have a say at SEN tribunals, the majority agreed that they should but we're unsure of how to realise that within the current system. This is just a quote to finish. This is from one Northern Irish parent who said, everybody says we have legislation that says children have to be listened to, but it's not worth the paper it's written on. We've got the UN Convention on the Rights of Child, for goodness sake. We might as well put that in the bin. I would suggest that this doesn't have to be the case. By addressing some of the fundamental issues for all users, we could relay some of the concerns regarding children's participation. So with a little commitment, fortitude, enabling practices, processes and imagination, child participation could be realised. And in reforming the system to ensure their involvement, we could seize the opportunity to make the tribunal more accessible, participatory and fair for everyone. Thank you.